My interest in the Alamo, of course, I'm sure my mother carried me there in her arms when I was a little baby, no doubt. But my first uh, sort of active memory about it was, was uh, I was six years old and I'm sitting on the couch with my little coonskin hat, <laughs> looking at that black and white TV with the rabbit ears and here comes Walt Disney and Davy Crockett, you know, <laughs> couldn't miss a minute of it. Uh, but actually, the fa I have a kind of a family history connected to the Alamo. Uh, my kids are seventh generation Texans, and uh, through their mother's line, Holly, which is, she's back there somewhere, their great grandfather to the fifth was uh, Gordon C. Jennings. He's the oldest defender of the Alamo. And his cousin James died at uh, Goliad. So we kind of, uh, you know, have, for most of our life, have heard heard stories about the Alamo and have been personally personally interested in it. But what, what I want to do today is explore a little bit on the Army's relation to the Alamo. So we're going to take the chronology kind of beyond uh, the Texas Revolution and then into the three decades that the Army was directly related to the Alamo here in San Antonio. It, the story really starts back in the summer of 1845 when Texas was annexed as a as a state. Uh, and then in July of 1845, James uh, Polk, the president, had ordered uh, Zachary Taylor, who was over on the Louisiana border with what was called the Army of Observation. And they were observing the uh, events in uh, Texas, particularly the dispute between the what was the border, the Nueces River, or the Rio Grande. I won't get into that piece of it today, but uh, needless to say, in, uh, 40, in uh, July of 45, uh, Polk orders Taylor to go forward from the Louisiana border and become the Army of Occupation rather than the Army of Observation. So Taylor takes this fairly small army, about 3,500 at the time, lands at Corpus Christi, and they go into camp there and, uh, and train. However, the Second Dragoon Regiment, the Mounted Regiment, one of them, actually went overland, and uh, they become the, the the first ones to enter San Antonio, the first uh, soldiers uh, of the Federal forces. Uh, in October of uh, 45, 20 October 45, two companies of Second Dragoons under Thomas Fauntleroy come down through Austin and then arrive in uh, arrive in San Antonio. Uh, it's about 119 soldiers. Hopefully this will work. There's a map. I want to. I'll refer to a few camps and stations. I'm, 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 the purpose of this is to show you that the army activity is a lot larger than just the Alamo, and it kind of goes over time. So uh, the, uh, Fontenoy and his 119 soldiers go into uh, Camp Behar, which they describe as six miles below. Can you s see the pointer? Okay. Yeah, dang right you can. Army pointer, army strong. <laughs> so, so they go into <laughs> they go into Camp Behar. They really only stay there about a week, and then eventually they'll they'll move into town. We're not quite sure where you know in the center. I, I guess I should orient this map. It's looking like that's. 410 right there. I can't tell. Oh, that's 410. They got me sideways to this thing, so I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, that's 16. 410 there. Uh, now I know where I am. Yeah. Uh, Camp Behar. So the uh, dragoons uh, go into Camp Behar, south of town, then they move up. Now, of course, it's on the river down there, and I don't believe they brought all those horses into town. I think it was. It was uh, all one that had mentioned, you know, you got to feed the horses, you can't do it downtown, so you got to leave a camp out there. Then the next thing that happens the next month is the crusty old uh, colonel for the second dragoons, uh, William S. Harney, arrives. He'll later become department commander and all that. But he, he arrives, and what's interesting on his return from the regiment is he says they're at Camp Almos, which we think is at, uh, uh, up on the Almos Basin up there. Uh, so they kind of, not quite in town, but they're kind of out of town. Well, uh, 
Meanwhile, what's happened, the, the Dragoons are supposed to join Taylor, and they're going to do that as Taylor goes on to Mexico. So they really just hang out here uh, 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 maybe two, three months, waiting on this whole thing to happen. In March of 46, Taylor will leave uh, Corpus and march to the Rio Grande. The whole sequence of those events goes to Fort Brown, builds Fort Brown, goes back, fights Resaca de la Palma, then uh, uh, Palo Alto. And then in July 46, almost a year after they had actually arrived, he's then across the river and moving towards uh, Camargo. Now, right about that same time, uh, John E. Wool, Brigadier General John E. Wool, got ordered to form up an army in San Antonio and r uh, run a parallel operation to Taylor. Uh, Wool's supposed to go up uh, into uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, sort of take care of the northern part of Mexico. So they start concentrating the forces right here in, uh, in San Antonio, about 3,400 men. He's got the, the regulars, the 1st and 2nd Dragoons, and he's got uh, part of the 4th Artillery and a small part of the 6th Infantry. But other than that, he has, also has a bunch of volunteer regiments. He's got the 1st uh, the, the and 2nd Illinois. He's got the Arkansas Mounted Volunteers and the Kentucky uh, Cavalry. Now, w when, when they did this, they decided the Quartermaster General of the Army, Thomas Jessup, he, brilliant guy, he was the Quartermaster General for 40 years, he decided Port Lavaca was how he was going to supply wool. Okay? So as the Army, the Army, by the way, went into Camp Crockett, which is, I think I can see it, right there. Crockett is, uh, it's, San, it's uh, San Pedro Park, but it's west of, uh, of San Antonio College. It's approximately uh, San Pedro and Myrtle Street is about where we think it is now. Anyway, so from Port Lavaca started landing all these supplies. There were about 1,112 wagons that had to go from Lavaca, come up to San Antonio. Uh, it's a 160 mile uh, trip. They, they did it with 500 wagons just making round trips. But the point is these, all these supplies for this army started piling up all over the San Antonio. And then came uh, the quartermaster officer, Major Charles Thomas. He arrives in September. Uh, he takes a look around. He's got supplies scattered all over the city. Of course, if he doesn't guard them, he's going to lose them. I mean, this is a, a immature theater of war. If you don't bring your own stuff, you got nothing. So he got very concerned, and he decides he wants to consolidate all the supplies in the Alamo compound, which is sitting down there empty. Okay, there's really nobody using that. The church is just, you know, there's no roof on it or anything, and there's a part of the old long barracks is still there. So Thomas then contacted uh, Bishop John Oden, who was in Galveston, and he, uh, well, he contacted him through a captain. He sent a captain to interview Bishop Oden and said, hey, we, we, we'd like to use the Alamo and store supplies in it and operate out of it. This is what Thomas reports back to General Jessup. He said, uh, Bishop Oden, quote, and I'm quoting here, would prefer the United States occupy it until it might be wanted for use of the church for the reason that the buildings were then being injured and destroyed by the inhabitants of the place, and he felt assured no further injury would be allowed while in the occupancy of the U.S. government. So in Bishop Oden's mind, it's a pretty good deal. The Army's going to occupy it, and it'll keep the, uh, the locals from what we now call repurposing stone. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this is kind of the first time the Army, in my thesis, saves the Alamo. Um, so they began this, uh, this logistics operation out of the Alamo compound. In September of 46, Wool's army will march out from, the, from here to the Rio Grande. He's got 350 wagons. The concept of support was these supplies were going to keep coming from Port Lavaca 
to San Antonio. They had set up a depot operation here, and then they were just going to keep feeding wagons to uh, to wool as he entered Mexico and crossed into the into the mountains of Chihuahua. Obviously, whoever thought that up had never been into Chihuahua before. <coughs> So just prior to Wool's departure, we have, a, we have a, a, a young Illinois volunteer sergeant named Sergeant uh, Edward Everett. He's 28 years old, he's English born, and he was the company clerk of Company A, First Illinois Volunteers. He had been shot in the knee, uh, he was a, a corporal of the guard or something, he tried to break up a fight, got shot in the knee. So he wound up on light duty, he couldn't go with Wool's uh, column. So he couldn't deploy with the Army, so he remained here, and he got appointed as the assistant quartermaster. Um, and this accident really resulted in our best written record that we have and our best drawings that we have uh, of the Alamo at the time. Um, Everett's sketches of the Alamo were published in the Secretary of War reports. They're public, uh, they're public property now. And, but he, more than that, in 1906, the Illinois uh, State Historical published his memoirs on this whole thing. So that's why we, we kind of have that. Now, <clears throat> Everett, with his skill at drawing and organization, became uh, the assistant for I another Illinois volunteer officer, Captain uh, James Harvey Ralston. Ralston took over quarter quartermaster operations when Wool departed. They had known each other. They were both from Quincy, Illinois. Ralston was a lawyer. He was a circuit judge and a, and a state senator. He was kind of the, one of the beau ideas of the volunteer, you know, flocking to the colors and, and that sort of thing. We have the picture of the Everett's wine drawing. He's really quite a draftsman. Can you see that okay? Notice this part right here. There's none of the distinctive uh, bell arch on top. So that's how <clears throat> That's pretty much how the Army found it. There's no uh, roof, by the way, either. And then uh, Everett drew a map that kind of showed what they were doing with the Alamo. Let me see if I can get this on the bleak here and kind of walk you through this, what was going on. So when the Army occupied it, this is the church itself. That's the front. So this would be Alamo Plaza out here. Um, down here is what they call the forage house. It'd be at the end of the plaza. Then we've got the quartermaster's office. This is Long Barracks right here. So the quartermaster's office is in there. Next to it is medical stores here. Uh, there's a saddle shop right in here. And then there's stores and equipment in this sort of last part of it. Then they built a carpenter and blacksmith shop out of a hakal structure right up here in the corner. The only thing actually in the Alamo is there was a little portion of it, and Everett, I'll read his description of it in a minute, right in here where they put, because it had real strong walls right there, they stored the, uh, uh, they stored ordnance stores, gunpowder, and stuff like that. Let me read you a little bit of what Everett has to say. Early in the spring of 1847, the idea of turning the then ruinous Alamo building to some account as a depot for army stores and for officers and workshops was entertained. Captain Rawson, seeing that they could be made available at an inconsiderable expense and having obtained permission from the quartermaster general to proceed, put the plan in execution. The lumber for the roofs, now he's talking about the long barracks roof, the lumber for the roofs, floors, uh, etc., were of southern pine. Shingles were obtained from Bastrop and hauled from there a distance of about 100 miles. Timber suitable for the purpose was not being obtainable nearer. The ruinous portions of, portions of the walls were repaired and the old plaster or concrete roofs were removed, which, uh, in which operations many thousands of bats were unceremoniously evicted. <laughs> but the church, but the church we respected as a historic relic, and as such characteristics, it was not marred by us. We had debris cleared away from the interior, in which process several skeletons and other relics of the siege were found. The keystone over the front entrance bore the date 1758, 
and adjoining the transept on the side, this is that vaulted area right on the side of the church, adjoining the transept on the side was a vaulted room strongly built of stone which we made use of after properly securing the entrances as a magazine in which was stored a large amount of ammunition in our hands. So then Ralston decides he wants to do, try, do a pretty major repair job, and he had sent to Quartermaster General Thomas Jessup uh, an estimate for repair of the entire compound was about $1,500, and another $1,700 to put a roof on the chapel. Uh, his point was, if we do this, it'll save a lot of house rents uh, around town, and we can do it. He, he had received no uh, reply or instructions after seven months and then, so, so what Ralston tells the quartermaster general finally just says, hey, I just went ahead and did it. He said, this is not roofing the, the, the Alamo Chapel yet. This is repairing the long barracks and doing all he can to do the rest of it. The, the chapel roof will come later. Public stores, this is Ralston to quartermaster Jessup. Public stores were so greatly exposed to the depredations of thieves as well as the damage from the weather, I afterwards thought it not prudent to wait any longer for orders, meaning you didn't tell me what to do, I'm gonna do it anyway. But have caused a part of the long bar of the main building, he calls it, this is the long barracks, of the Alamo to be repaired and supplied with a good roof and the ordnance stores and the principal part of the quartermaster store are now securely uh, st uh, stored there. And then he goes on to say, hey, I've saved a lot of money in rent by doing this. You know, I mean, when Texas became a state and the Army came, uh, unlike most of the other Western states, not an acre of land was taken by the federal government. I mean, 10 years later when the Army's told, okay, go and occupy the frontier of Texas and build these forts and do all this, guess what? Oh yeah, go build a fort, but make sure you pay rent to that landowner because you don't own any land in Texas. And so this is sort of part of that uh, idea. Now, uh, here's the interesting thing. The, the whole depot operation was set up to support wool and this idea of pushing trains forward into the Mexican interior. And then it turns out that, that wool's campaign was fairly brief and Secretary, I mean, uh, Quartermaster General Jessup said, hey, let's cut off that uh, Port Lavaca stuff and stop supplying him out of the Alamo. I can do it better through Camargo and the Rio Grande because he's now swung down to join, uh, to join Taylor's army. But what's interesting is that Rawson says, really, um, his whole operation in 1847 and 48 was to supply the Texas Ranging Company that were now scattered out on the frontier. Yeah, I didn't know this either, it was very interesting. So the, the Alamo operation really becomes to supply the ranging companies that are now trying to protect the frontier because remember, that's a federal government problem now, okay? We're, they're now a state. But the state is kind of uh, called out the militia of these ranging companies to do this while the federal government's occupied in Mexico. So then the federal government has this sort of responsibility of supplies. So that's what he did. He had 25 wagon teams that constantly, through 1847 and 1848, while the, the war in the interior of Mexico is going on, going out to supply, supply these companies. He says in his report he spent $258,000 supplying these Texas ranging companies. Now, today's dollars, that's a lot of money, okay, if you think about it. Well, Everett and Ralston remained at the Alamo Depot until November 48 when they both went back to headquarters. Everett, uh, Sergeant Everett got involved in preparing the Hughes Report, which was this fairly large report on Wall's uh, operations. Ralston had gotten out of the Army, and then he, uh, he served as a major in the, in the uh, Civil War. Then he had a legal and a political career, and then in 1864 in Nevada, he disappeared in the snowstorm. And it's now called Ralston's Desert, and it's near Nye, Nevada. So he, he was a pretty well-known and respected guy. Let me just recap real quick on the Mexican War. The way the quartermaster operations worked, the main effort was uh, Taylor's Army here, mostly supplied up the Rio Grande to Camargo, 
and then in uh, by wagons. Huge operation at, uh, at Port Isabel and Brazos Santiago. Wool's army got supplied both from Corpus and from Port Lavaca, and as this died down, actually the Corpus operation continued because now Ralston has to supply all these scattered uh, uh, units up on the Texas frontier. So this was sort of how quartermaster operations work in, in the Mexican War. The, at, at the end of the war, Topo engineer said something really interesting about San Antonio. Okay, the war's almost down, it's, it's winding over, and he said, uh, the build, this is what he tells the quartermaster general, the buildings belonging to the government in town might be conveniently converted into hospitals and barracks for a considerable force. The Alamo on the left bank of the river, if placed in a suitable state of repair, would accommodate a regiment, and at the same time might be rendered a strong and, uh, a strong, and a strong defensive work, well supplied with water. So this idea begins to take on, let's, let's try to do something or improve the Alamo. Well, in February 1859, uh, 49, I'm sorry, the, the, the war is winding down and uh, the regular army begins to filter back into San Antonio. In February of 49, John Haskell King and two companies of, uh, of uh, uh, First Infantry arrive. They go into Camp Terret near San Antonio. I think I have another map. Yeah, Camp Terret, which is right here, uh, a little bit uh, part downtown. And then uh, right after that, Jefferson Van Horn, Major Jefferson Van Horn of the 3rd Infantry, he shows up with a huge, pretty huge contingent. And what they, they go into camp at Camp Salado. I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, there it is, right there on the, on the river. But they're only going to be there, they're just there long enough to organize, and they're the ones going to march to El Paso, uh, follow Whitting's earlier route, and essentially make what's now US 90 to El Paso. They'll cut that road as they go along and then occupy what later became uh, Fort Bliss. And then there were some other, you know, there's some other camps around that, were, that occurred. But the guy I want to get to is this guy, Edwin Burr Babbitt. He arrives in San Antonio and he is the uh, he is the department quartermaster. The post of San Antonio had its own quartermaster, and the guy just sort of supplied guys that were hanging around town. But this guy, his job was to, you know, all this army in Texas, so it's a pretty, pretty big job. So he goes in and becomes the 8th and 9th military department quartermaster. He's a USMA graduate. He graduated from West Point in 1826 and spent a long time as a, as a quartermaster. Uh, so in March of 49, Babbitt sends a letter to Jessup to build a new post for three companies of infantry and one company of dragoons for $50,000. His idea, hey, we're going we're gonna to tear down the Alamo and the long barracks and demolish all that, and then we're going we're gonna to build a brand new post on, the, on that site. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, Jessup, this time he saves the Alamo, okay, quartermaster general. And it wasn't out of esoteric reason. It just cost too damn much to do that. You know, that's what he's telling him. Here's what, uh, here's what Jessup sends back to Babbitt. He says, land cannot be purchased without authority from Congress. The Alamo, if repaired, I should think, would furnish the ample accommodations for the force retained in San Antonio. The Texian Congress in 1841 granted the church of, of the Alamo to the Catholics, but no other portion of the property. Uh, by repairing and occupying the Alamo, we would get rid of the difficulty as to the purchase of land on which to build. San Antonio cannot, from the rapid improvement of the frontier, be long a military station. <laughs> in, in quote. <laughs> Je Jessup had never met a Comanche, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> All right. Well, what happens is Babbitt will write back and say, hey, none of them are suitable for barracks. They're too old, but I can use them pretty good for store hit, storehouse, and he gets permission to do that. So, but to, to use it now, all of a sudden, the Catholic Church sort of interested, okay, now you're going to do this long-term deal. 
So he started, the, uh, the bishop hired a guy named uh, B. Callahan, it says in the records. If you look in the San Antonio City Council stuff, it's Brian Callahan. There's a Callahan famous name around here. His real name actually is O'Brien Callahan. But anyway, he becomes the agent, and the two began negotiation on the lease of the buildings. And eventually, the lease was signed for $150. Keep in mind, the state deeded the church, not the whole Alamo ground. So the rest of it was kind of up in the air. Uh, uh, for the lease of the Alamo building, so long as they may be required. That's the terms of the lease. So um, then Babbitt continues to improve the long barracks and all this. And then it comes down to... Uh, May of 1850, when he decides, okay, I really need the church building as well. I'm going to put a roof on it. I'm going to improve it. And this is where the famous roof comes. In May, 18 May, 1850, Babbitt writes to Jessup, and this is the only way, this one sentence is the only way we know when that roof went on there. Okay? He says, I am about to cover the Alamo church by which I shall make it a very useful building for the public service. He never records anything else about that. You know, it's kind of interesting. So, uh, I think I'm supposed to go to a picture of the Alamo. So, he covers the church, he covers the Alamo, and then what's about that? See that? Remember how it was in Everett's photo? Straight across. So, now we get this bell shaped facade that's the facade that's so famous. Okay? The question is uh, kind of where did that come from? And so uh, I have a friend of mine, we've been arguing history for 30 years, but I think he's probably finally right. Okay. Uh, jo George Nelson, in his illustrated uh, history of the Alamo, he has this theory that actually that idea, if not just the stone, actually came from San Jose Mission. And I want to show you why. If you look at the drawings, I, I, hopefully I'm going the right day. Okay, this is San Jose Mission. If you look right there, you see that? That arch, that bell-shaped thing? This is the convento, the convent. That bell-shaped, that bell-shaped arch. Let's see if I hit the right button. Uh, and then this is, I uh, think, the Herman Lindquist photo. You can see it right there. See that? Okay. So that Lunguis lithograph, by the way, it's hanging in the, have you ever been to the uh, sixth floor of the Central Library? They got all his original paintings up there. It's unbelievable. Six of them, they're beautiful. So anyway, there's the bell-shaped curve. George, are you here? There he is, sitting in the back. So if you think this is a crazy idea, he's sitting right back there. <laughs> you can talk to him after. <laughs> But nevertheless, if you look later, this is a 1920s photograph, 1927. Where'd that thing go? You know? So maybe he got the idea and reproduced it. Maybe he took the actual stone. I don't know. I just think, <coughs> I, I just think it's, a, it's a very interesting idea. I just, I, I'm fascinated by this whole thing. Okay, so. Uh, So here we got Babbitt. He fixes the Alamo and he starts operations. Listen to the scale of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, later operations. Listen to the scale of what's coming out of the Alamo and the Alamo compound. So between June of 1850 and June of 1851, one year, this is Babbitt's report to, to uh, 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 Jessup, 750 wagons, mostly uh, government and 98 contractor wagons, 946 Teamsters he hired, 4,720 mules, 622 oxen, 2.1 million pounds of freight, cost him uh, two, uh, 220, uh, I'm sorry, 255 hundred thousands of pounds moved by contractors. This was mainly George Thomas Howard, uh, L.G. Capers, and uh, Francisco Espinosa. These were sort of the first guys that got into this army contracting business. At the same time, he issued 71,000 bushels of corn, 1.2 million pounds of hay, and a total cost of $87,000. That didn't go free. 
he, that $87,000 went into local pockets getting the, to the farmers to get that stuff. He bought 1,573 horses uh, and mules for $99,000. Okay. Uh, at the same time, he purchased, this was from July 49 to June 51, purchased 260,000 board feet of lumber, 320,000 shingles. These were transported mainly, oh, he transported from the coast to San Antonio. Not free, they pay for every pound. Uh, 5.3 million pounds of freight. This is when the freight business began in Texas, right here. Okay, the serious long haul freight. All right, so in that case, Babbitt wanted to wreck the Alamo, build a whole fort. General Jessup said, no, you're not going to do it. So he sort of saved the Alamo by doing that. Now, he only did it because he thought it was too expensive. And they weren't going to be around very long because uh, they were going to defeat the, the uh, advance the frontier quick. Now, I'll talk a little bit about this general system. You can see, I can't really see that too well. Where's my thing? I tell what I'm looking at. Here. I got five minutes. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this gives you this gives you a general idea of the that must be Indianola. That became the major port. See this? They transport the supplies here, and then look at all this. How Alamo becomes a hub to 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 supply all the rest of these forts that have now advanced on the, advanced on the frontier. So it becomes really, really significant. Uh, and does so for the next 30 years. It does the same thing. Um, I got another one. This one is really interesting because most of this early part, this was mainly government wagons and soldiers, and they were hanging around the Alamos, like two or 300 soldiers as Teamsters. But the Quartermaster General discovered the soldiers are terrible. They don't take care of the horses and mules. When they're not hot, there's a good picture of the Alamo wa wagon in front of the Alamo Vance building. I'm going too fast. Oh, we leased the, we leased the Vance building. What happened was the Alamo was good for logistics operations, but it didn't serve very well for a headquarters or for barracks. It wasn't uh, very uh, useful for that. The, uh, Headquarters, Persford Smith jumped the headquarters down to Corpus for about four years there. But we couldn't take the supplies down there because the coast was terrible. The humidity and the salt and everything would ruin supplies really quick. So the whole quartermaster operation stayed up here. And then uh, uh, when they finally came back, they leased from William Vance, the Vance brothers, famous uh, uh, merchants here, what was called the Brick Block. It's now the site of the Gunther Hotel. And so they built the brick block, and the Army's headquarters went into there. Uh, and then this went along even after the Civil War. We came back, still occupied the Alamo. The, the statistics are about the same. This shows after the war. By the way, the first land purchase the federal government made here, it wasn't a gift, it was a gift, not a purchase. That's the San Antonio uh, arsenal there. Uh, it was in 1858. It was the very first bit of uh, very first bit of, of land that we had. Then we have uh, the Maverick Building, which we leased. There's another picture of the Alamo without the wagons. That's the Maverick Building. Or, I'm sorry, that's the French Building in '61, and that's the Maverick Building. So now we're leasing. The Quartermaster General said, "I'm spending $25,000 on rent in San Antonio. I don't want to do that anymore." So after the Civil War, they began to negotiate with the city of San Antonio to build uh, what became the Quadrangle on Government Hill, now Fort Sam Houston. Come on. That's a plane, or that's an original plane. Now, originally it was supposed to be a quad with just a single wall there, but when the, the headquarters department commander, he got to looking at it one day, he said, hey, why don't we put a second story on it? I'll just move my headquarters in there. So it was an afterthought, it was added. Uh, there's the tower, and there's a good, sort of a good picture. This is the quad right there, and that's uh, uh, what we now call staff post right there. So, uh, to speak a little bit about the quad, Edward Braden and company built it. 
They finished it in February 78. Uh, 1.8 acres under roof. Think about that. 1.8 acres. 1.1 million uh, cubic feet of storage. It's huge. And then uh, the tower's 90 feet high. By the way, in the top of that tower, it's actually a fire suppression system. 6,000 gallon water tank that gravity feeds down into all of those storerooms. It's the very first of its kind. It was invented for, just for that. They, they cost $100,000 to build the quadrangle. Pretty, pretty good deal. All right, so let me wrap up with the Army had a direct relationship with the Alamo for three decades. And I could go into endless detail after the Civil War as well, but just want to, I, I, my argument, I, the Army saved the Alamo from destruction certainly in 1846 and probably again in 1850 when they wouldn't let them, uh, we wouldn't let uh, Babbitt build that post that he wanted to, uh, uh, Jessup. The, I think there's a similar thesis. In the last few years, think about what the Army saved here. Long barracks built by the architect Alfred Giles on Fort Sam. We rehabbed that. The original station hospital, we rehabbed it. The post theater, classic architecture. We spent about 120, 130 million dollars just on those three buildings. Okay, so the Army's, uh, the Army's effort to do historic preservation is kind of real. We're pretty dang green, let me tell you. We are. <laughs> And uh, so I'll stop there for questions. Good, we only have one minute. Uh, <laughs> uh, one or two questions is most we can do. And, and ask something for George to answer, and then I won't know. Questions? What happened, what happened to the skeletons and the relics? You know, I kind of doubt that story. I mean, uh, uh, no. it, it kind of, I don't know. I can't answer that, I'm really not a, when they dug up the floor of the Alamo, well, I doubt if they came from the battle. I mean, the, there was a habit of burying people in church floors that had gone on forever and ever and ever. So my, my guess is when I first read that, it was sort of like, yeah, well, you know, probably somebody from 50 or 100 years before. So I don't have any idea what, whether the story's even true. Last, last question. Colonel, um, in the church where the, I guess we would call it now the side room, the uh, monk burial room, as well as the sacristy, is, I'm under the impression that for the, once the army left, that both of those rooms were literally walled in, if you will. I don't know if that's true, but yet when soldiers tell me they came down in the 50s and 60s on furlough, they would take a peek in, it was just all wall. Can you, like, Explain or elaborate I, I, what happened or what I don't, might have happened to that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I do know that the, when they put a floor in the upper side, the top was all grain. And I have a picture of the upper floor. It's just it's straight. You can see all the way across it. But I, can, I can't answer that question. We'd have to ask an uh, Alamo architect or archaeologist. I really don't know the answer to that one. Sir? Uh, one more. Starting in 1859, it, it the officers that came every, through here. Every first person account, uh, there's, there's, I've read a, almost every officer's account of coming through San Antonio, and all of them talk about the mayor. It was the only place to stay if you were of the officer class for a long time. The other is John Tuhig, who was a local banker. He was in the habit of entertaining uh, uh, guests, and uh, especially officers. And so they all mention him, Mr. Tuhig, at us to dinner. And by the way, his family's still here. In fact, I work with his uh, great, great, great grandson. I've eaten at the that table. I think we need to quit. We're out of time. Please help me thanking Colonel Smith.